this is a little story I want to tell you that actually happened to me and my family. So I was about 12 years old. We lived in Alabama in Russell County outside the city, and we lived on a dead-end dirt street surrounded by 100 acres or more of woods. Pine trees, lots of pine trees. The wealthy property owner who lived on our street owned uh, thousands and thousands of acres, and he had a lumber company, so he would plant pine trees and then cut them for lumber. And we were in our carport. It was like a garage, but we didn't have a door on it. And I'm watching this steady parade of cars going up and down our road, and I'm thinking, what in the world? It's a dead-end street. Up there going a solid line going up our road and a solid line going down. And I thought, what in the world is going on on our street? So I stepped out. And at first I thought it was a tornado, but it was a sunny day. We had a, a column of smoke that rose probably over a thousand feet in the air. And when I looked at it, I was stunned and we had a forest fire. But it's across the street from us, so we're not in any real danger. So we all went out and we thought there's only the corner house, the wealthy property owner, and then there's about five other houses. And we thought we need to go help. So my dad, my sisters, my brother, and we, we went back into the woods, and it was low burning like this. So they sent a, a bulldozer out to cut a fire line. So the bulldozer had gone by, and it cut a fire line about 18 inches wide, and then the dirt piled left and right, made it about three feet wide. And he went all the way around, so when the fire gets there, because there's pine straw, there's, there's dead, dry pine straw on the ground, and it's burning away, the flames are about that high. But when we walked back there, the wind would blow and the flames would jump up five or six feet high. And so you jump back. So I came back out. My mom was really upset because she couldn't see what was going on. So she's kind of screaming. The guy in the, in the machine got stuck in the marsh and he's down there screaming for help. He's yelling help as loud as he can. And the fire is still coming and the fire jumped the line. The wind blew and the fire went all the way over the line and it's coming again towards the houses. Now, everybody has a big 500-gallon propane tank in their yard, and the guy across the street, his was at the back of the yard surrounded by a bunch of brush and thicket. So you can go to the next one, next slide. So when the wind would blow, this is exactly what would happen. The fire would shoot partway up the trees, uh, up high enough to, to drive you back. So the fire finally came up into the backyards. Now, we're safe, and we could have stayed on our side of the street, but we're calling the fire department. They're saying, you're outside the city. The fire trucks aren't allowed to come out outside of the city. So we said, who do we call? And they said, there are no firemen to help you. You're on your own. So it's neighbors helping neighbors, or it's no help. I thought, wow, that's good. Everybody listen. Nobody's coming to our aid. It's just us, seven or eight houses of neighbors, that we're going to fight this fire together. We care about our neighbors. We don't want their houses to burn. We don't want anybody to get hurt. So we cross the road from our safety and we go to help the neighbors because we care about them. I'm just using this as an example, but it is true. Freddie Foster's tank is all the way back in that thicket. Now, I don't know if you know, but a liquid gas like propane, John knows this, if it gets hot enough, which I doubt it would with a thicket, it will blevy. It's called a boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion. And it looks about like an atomic bomb. When it goes off, <laughs> there was one in Tennessee and it took out almost downtown. I mean, a blevy is horrible. Uh, it looks just like an atomic bomb. It's a big mushroom fireball and cloud when they go because the liquid gets so hot when it finally blows, it's already boiling and it expands so fast, it's horrible. So we're kind of picturing that. So here's, everybody's back out of the woods now in this yard trying to fight this fire back. We've got his garden hose, which is like putting a water gun. It's doing nothing. So go to the next slide. So this is about how close it is to his house. It's burning high because it's in the thicket and it's right around the gas tank burning. So next slide, this is what finally comes. That was the help we got. Alabama Forest Service sent us a pickup truck with a one inch line and a water tank in the back and they can't start the motor. It was a Briggs and Stratton three horsepower engine on the pump. Thankfully, as God would have it, I have a go-kart with a three horsepower Briggs and Stratton engine and I'm keeping it running all the time. I would take the heads off of it and clean the pistons and all. So I knew, I mean, even though I was 12, I could, I could take an engine apart, you know, uh, an engine like that, put it back together. So I grabbed tools and I went over and I got the engine running. 
We pulled the one inch line back and we were able to knock down the fire at least around the gas tank. And finally with everybody's rakes and shovels, we got the fire out. What's the purpose of this story? As I said, we could have stayed on our side of the street, but if you care enough about your neighbors and friends and relatives who are in danger of fire, you go to help, okay? And I want you to apply this to the spiritual aspect of life. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm shame on me, and I'm going to shame on all of us. How many of you know the names of all the neighbors on your street? Just raise your hand. If on your street, you know the names of everybody on your street, you've talked to them. And how many years have you been here? We've been here 11 years. And up until a year and a half ago, I couldn't have told you the names of most of the people here. But now I can tell you all their names, and I pray for them every day, and I talk to them. That's shame on me. For almost 10 years, I'm living next door to people, across the street from people, and I don't even know who they are, and I've never told them about Jesus, and I'm supposed to be a Christian, and we're supposed to be operating in love. God so loved the world that he stepped out of heaven and came down and became one of us, but we can't humble ourselves to go across the street to a lost person, and yet we want to get somebody to sponsor us to go to Timbuktu, pay $4,000 so we can go there on a two-week spree and tell people about Jesus. I have people all the time that say, will you sponsor me to be a missionary? And I don't mean to be mean, but my question is, have you ministered to everybody on your block? No, I don't know them. I'm not paying $4,000 for you to go over to Timbuktu. You haven't even talked to your neighbors yet. So your heart is not really for people. It's a group of us. We're going to have fun. I don't mean to have fun. I'm not down in missionary work. But you're not for missionary work because if you haven't even told your neighbor or your coworker, what in the world are you flying thousands of miles for to tell somebody about Jesus and your neighbor doesn't know about Jesus? You get where I'm coming from? The, the love is supposed to be, our motivation is love. Paul said, if I give my body to be burned, give all my goods to feed the poor, and it's not in love, I, I'm, I, it counts nothing. Okay?